Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this LGBTQIA plus History Month event, co-hosted by the University of Sydney Library and the Pride Network. My name is Antonia Makata, and I'm the Director of Central Services here at the Library. Now, before we begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people, and I'd like to pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to the knowledges embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. This afternoon, we welcome our guest speaker, Peter Duval, AM. Peter, born 1938 in Lusdane in the Hague, Netherlands, is well known to the community in Sydney as a prolific and long-term LGBTQI plus rights activist and author. His significant contributions to the LGBTQIA plus community date back to the 1970s. At this important time in our community's struggle, his fighting spirit and refusal to accept the discriminatory social and political paradigm have helped to create the more accepting environment that we enjoy today. Activism during this time was often at great personal risk and I recognize we have much to be grateful for to the activists of this era, including Peter. I just before we begin, I'd like to run through a small selection of Peter's many contributions and achievements for the community. These include being a founding member of Camp Inc. And Camp stands for the Campaign Against Moral Persecution, and this was in 1970. This was the first national homosexual rights organisation in Australia, and it was responsible for the Camp Inc. magazine. Peter was involved in the first homosexual rights demonstration in Sydney in 1971 in support of law reform. He and his now deceased partner, Peter Bonsall Boone, also appeared in 1972 on the national ABC TV checkerboard program. And Peter will talk about this a little later on in today's presentation. In 1973, Peter, Peter and his partner established the first Australian homosexual specific counseling and telephone information service called Phone a Friend in the front room of their own home. In 1976, in conjunction with Camp Inc, he initiated and organized the first ever two-day tribunal on homosexuals and discrimination. This resulted in the New South Wales state government developing anti-discrimination legislation. It's amazing work. Peter became a member of the Sydney Gay Task Force in the late 1970s and participated in the 1978 Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. During the 1980s, Peter was a health promotion coordinator at the Bankstown Community Health Centre and a volunteer immigration advisor with New South Wales Gay and Lesbian Immigration Task Force from 1989 to 98. In 2016 and 17, Peter also did extensive media appearances advocating marriage law equality. Peter, your contributions to the Australian LGBTQIA plus community are truly awe-inspiring and we're so honoured to host you here today. You have such a rich story to tell, and that is so important to the co community history. I'd like to invite you to the microphone to talk about some of the experiences that led to your activism, following which we'll have a Q&A in which the library's LGBTQIA plus liaison officer, Sam Farrell, will ask you about the amazing work you've done in response to the challenges the community have, has faced. Um, everybody, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Peter the, to the microphone. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Antonia, for your, for your heartfelt introduction. A big thank you also to the University of Sydney Library and the University's Pride Network for co-hosting this history event. Thank you goes to Curtis, Jordan and Sam for their technical support and the forthcoming Q&A. It's so wonderful to have the opportunity to share with you all a slice of my personal and our community's 50 year history and more so during this year's LGBT History Month. Today I meet with you on Wongo country, which was known as Wana, meaning West. It originally extended from the suburbs of Belmain and Birchgrove in the east to Silverwater and Auburn in the west. The northern boundary was the Parramatta River. I wish to pay my respects to your elders past, present and those emerging. One of your leaders taught me the following powerful words. Only those who have known discrimination truly know it's evil. Only those who have never experienced prejudice 
can discount the importance of laws that provide equality, justice, and inclusiveness for all. Wearing a red earth colored dress, symbolic of her wondrous land, Deborah Cheatham's Yorta Yorta soprano voice. Oh, it feeds my soul. Hearing Deborah's stolen generation story with her songs of belonging, yes, that made me cry. Yet I became filled with rainbow, rainbow pride when she introduced on stage her female accompanist as also being her life partner. Wow. They were coupled that night on city recital hall stage, imbuing me with your beautiful culture. At the, at the first 1978 Sydney Mardi Gras, I and other 78ers suffered police violence. At, at Sydney's King's Cross, a part of your dreaming land, in return, we shouted and screamed, stop police attacks on gays, women and blacks. Now your First Nation leads our annual Mardi Gras parade. It's your welcome to country for us. When the 78ers reach Taylor Square, you honor us with your, with, with your smoking ceremony that cleanses us of bad spirits and it sends us on our way together with you to, to a prouder, brighter future. I live here in solidarity at my house called Checkerboard, built on land which always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Elsewhere on your ancient ancestral land, yes, 60,000 years old, the campaign against moral persecution, better known as Camp Inc., it was born. 50 years ago, it became the first national homosexual rights movement in Australia. It was the foundation stone, so to speak, of what we today call our LGBTQIA plus community. This is the lived history of a 1966 gay liberation warrior couple, Peter and Bon, who became part of something special. Yes, and it lives on. Here's a picture of our liberation warriors and their 1960s woeful, oppressive lives. Two handsome homosexual men, both 28, became a couple unceremoniously in 1966. For one, it was love at first sight, while the other needed time a more gradual process. Only a little time passed before the air was filled with lust, love, light and passion. There was something in the air that night. They were infatuated with each other and oh, they became starry, starry eyed. They're both Caucasian, but from very different social strata and backgrounds. One from a war-ravaged middle European country with a lower working class, war-disrupted childhood. He's an atheist. The other a middle class and well-educated Australian Anglican. He carries religious battle scars because of his courage. On and off during the late 1960s, our gay liberation warriors, when comforting each other, 
about our distressed and oppressive lives, oh, in a gentle embrace, frequently and longingly said, like a lament, if only there was a homosexual rights organization we could join. Both yearned for a better life. No, not materially, nor physically, but living as a recognized homosexual couple. I'm going to look back 50, 60 years and beyond. It will give you a sense of what lives for us homosexuals was like. <clears throat> New South Wales Police Central Intelligence Branches advised squad detectives, they were told in 1958 that homosexuals were a cancer in the community. Our warriors indignantly responded, how dare they? And what a hurtful, disgusting put down. The 1966 New South Wales illiberal Premier Robert Eskin shouted disgustingly, run the bastards over, when facing demonstrators, while he was seated in his open top luxury car. Homosexuals, trans and intersex people more so, we were the underdogs, kicked from every direction. They just come off the earth, said some, omnipresent from time immemorial, dark religious, communal and political forces attempted to pound us into the ground. Warriors frequently overheard, but it's so hard to believe today that during the 1960s, it was frequently said, I've never met a homosexual before. New South Wales Police Commissioner Colin Delaney described homosexuality as Australia's greatest menace. Our warrior couple felt awful, disgusted and distraught, being compared with causing physical destruction, harm, being a threat or a danger. To what, to whom and where? Fred's, Fred Niles festered of light stood for, so they said, Christian nuclear families and decency values. Decency, rainbow families, nor Christianity was in the festival's DNA. Our liberation, worried, our liberation warriors labeled them <laughs> the festival of darkness. They're the spitting image of today's Australian Christian lobby. The former and latter two-faced darkness crowd are best described as follows. Upon leaving their mother's warm, colorful, secure, nurturing wombs, they immediately descend into dark, dingy, damp and deep mines never to re-emerge or see the light. Most terribly, homosexual men were criminals, yes, for loving and sharing their bodies, willingly, with each other. Our two loving warrior men were burdened by archaic British colonial laws. Their same-sex physical love it was labeled not to be named among Christians and an unnatural act. It's not surprising that acceptance of one's homosexuality 
a distant took the bravery of a soldier sprinting towards a hostile enemy. For seven years until 1973, our warriors' loving relationship, it was judged, labeled, demonized as sexual orientation disturbance or a mental illness. It took you learned psychiatrists until that year, 1973, to understand that our sexual behavior is normal. Our couple and others responded nonchalantly. <laughs> That's something us homosexuals have known forever. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, we're only halfway in this 1950s, 60s misery marathon of oppression and injustice. Here's a reason why gays' darkest hours were inside closed closets. Gays felt they carried a second-class citizen label. We marched, we shouted, we rallied, we yelled, keep your laws of our bodies. Ah. Sweet success came in 1984. Our lovemaking was no longer a criminal offense. Overnight snuggled up in bed, our warrior's lovemaking wasn't an abominable crime any longer, but only in the eyes of New South Wales statutes. Dogmatic, ultra-conservative Melbourne Archbishop, yes, George Pell, in his fundamentalist Christian crusades, played God. No, it was worse. He believed he was God. Much to the horror of our religious warrior, he, George, refused the Rainbow Sash movement a group of gay Catholics, one of the seven holy sacraments, yes, communion. Our atheist warrior was outraged and said that Bishop George is an anathema to human rights and equality. Aversion therapy was rife, pervasively perpetrated by medicos during the early 1970s. Now gay conversion therapy has emerged. Yes, via religious groups and cults. This ain't a happy Jan, nor euphoric epoch in our community's lives. Our Anglican warrior believed human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. Not surprising, our atheist warrior held a different, an evolutionary view. Yet, despite coming from very different directions, both believed that his former medical and now religious quackery does our LGBTQI plus community Oh, much more harm than good. Warriors agreed to re-sculpture a human's perfectly wonderful natural sexuality for the sake of conforming to fundamentalist dogma. It's really immoral. Warrior reflecting on life and this 50 year of human psyche butchering. It's years of horrors, suicides, misery, destruction. Ah, he realized, tensed up with pained emotions. Ah, it resembled war years, human devastation, but without bombs, 
V2s, gunfire, nor exploding mines. Warrior silently, teary-eyed, laments, when will they, these pious religious butchers, ever learn? Our, lover, <clears throat> our loving warrior couple were, oh, so tempted, but too anxious and fearful to hold hands, have tender male embraces, kiss in Sydney's public place, yes, Martin Place. They knew it came with great risk and genuine fear of police arrest and prosecution. New South Wales female public servants couldn't remain employed once they got married. Reflecting some years later, our liberation warriors concluded this, that this was an apex during the heterosexist nuclear family era and its so pervasive sexual stereotyping. Rainbow families, child custody, adoption, and child fostering. Oh, they were our warrior's pipe dreams. A dream of sheer delight. Bringing about change was tough and so difficult to do. Our warriors and others boldly beavered bravely 24 7 with little or no positive results. However, eventually these likable warrior men put their lives on the line to educate and change a nation. This was the 1960s, 70s Australia, where homosexuals lived, loved, longed to be equal, bravely beavered, struggled, feared, worked for better times. Yes, belonging was their love, desire, need, wish, and aim. On 10 September 1970 morning, our warriors, as per usual, opened their Australian newspaper. Laughter, joy with tears erupted. Here is our manna from heaven. Our wish has been granted. The campaign against moral persecution, camping was born. Our warrior couple made a raucous clucking cry like chooks upon reading that John Ware and Christabel Pohl were camping's parents, so to speak. Putting pen to paper, our liberation warriors courageously joined, becoming foundation members of the first Australian national homosexual rights movement. Within no time, 19 September 1970, to be precise, a follow-up Australian newspaper article appeared. Barely 10 days after penning their letter, a John Ware 1970, sorry, a John Ware 19 September 1970 respond a response arrived, partly saying, judging from your letter, you and Peter seem to be the type of stable people we are trying to attract as active members. Yippee, our warrior said, we're in the starting blocks of our 50 year liberation journey. Yeah, we're on our way. Thank you so much for sharing that history with us today, Peter. Um, hello everyone. My name is Sam and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the library's LGBTQIA liaison officer and I will be your MC for the next half an hour. 
It's an absolute honour and privilege to be asking Peter questions today about his activism in the 70s, including his involvement with Camp Inc, his iconic appearance on the Checkerboard program and his long-lasting impact on the LGBTQIA plus community. Are you ready, Peter? I sure am. <laughs> As you mentioned in your speech just now, Camp Inc was the first national homosexual organisation. Can you tell me the significance of Camp Inc's journal called Camp Inc? Well, Camp Inc was an in-house journal and it was the first one, as far as I'm aware, of any uh, national uh, uh, journal to go out. So the, journal, the main role of the journal was to disseminate news about what was happening in Sydney and of course, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. And it, it was posted out in plain wrappers. <laughs> you might think this is strange, but it was important, of course, to protect the anonymity of many people in, of our community who hadn't come out and didn't want to come out because there were huge risks uh, uh, attached to coming out. It would make sense back in those days to want to hide their identity too, because as you mentioned, coming out of the 50s and the 60s was a horror in a lot of ways for the LGBTQIA plus community. Indeed. So having the opportunity to actually read content by other gay people must have been mind blowing for so many. Yes. And it had, you know, very current, uh, uh, articles in it about example aversion therapy as I've pointed out in my talk in the 70s oh it was so pervasive mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, it told other members how what an awful thing it was and how basically how unnecessary it is mm -hmm. to change a per you know a person's sexuality uh, it had you know uh, as well uh, advertisement, people trying to make contact. It had a poetry section from time to time, but it mainly concentrated on the activities that were happening in terms of trying to, to bring about change. And it sounds like it also brought about community in, in a sense, because you were connecting people with stories, with advertisements, uh, with activism, um, Yes, and it was encouraging people, of course. The underlying uh, uh, theme was, you know, encouraging people to come out and, and cross that very difficult bridge for many. Yeah, and speaking of coming out, you and your beautiful partner, Bond, did the ultimate come out when you appeared on the <laughs> ABC Nationals TV checkerboard program. Uh, can you tell me more about that experience? Well, so the, the checkerboard program came about. So there was a unit within the ABC, very progressive at the time. Uh, they, want, they wanted to do a program about homosexuality because for, since 1969, when the New York Stonewall Inn riots, that's when our international movement started. The, the ABC Checkerboard program realized that it, it wanted and it needed to deal with an issue which was so, so silent in those days, homosexuality. So because Camp Inc. Had existed at, at the time, the only organization, they approached Camp Inc. and came to one of our uh, meetings here in Darling Street, 393 Darling Street, where our club rooms were. Uh, Priscilla Tambone, she, who was the researcher with the program, and uh, she went around asking people, you know, would they be prepared to go on checkerboard and, you know, be a, be a lesbian or being a male homosexual couple? Mm -hmm. So she asked quite a few and eventually she asked us and we said, yeah, happy to do it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Let's do it. <laughs> because, because I, you know, we, like I said in the story, we, we always felt that we, there, were, there would be, it would be wonderful if there was something we could make a contribution 
to improve our our own lives, of course, but also of our community. Yeah, and what better way to do that than on national TV? <laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> but in a way, it was a it was an easy coming out. You know what I mean? It's like we're doing today. I'm telling you things which I might not tell you. You know, if we're face to face, yeah. you, you get the point. Uh, but yes, it was a big coming out. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the uh, watershed moments of Australian history is that little peck of a kiss that you and Bond shared during the, the beginning of the program. Yeah, look, it, it, it was, but I, to my mind, the significance was that that was the very first time, as far as I know, that two men had a moment of wonderful intimacy. It was very momentarily, but it, it was there. And it, particularly in the era when, uh, you know, ockers were so dominant, the male, the patriarchal system was so strong. Mm -hmm. And to have the, just that moment that there, are other, there were other ways that men could interact, and we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I feel like showing that kiss is such a, such a sign of resistance as well. And I think uh, revolution, it's such a small gesture, but it can mean so much to some people. Yes, uh, it, it, it did because again, you know, it, I suppose we became role models in, in a way uh, that yeah, you can do that, but there might be consequences attached mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, yeah. Sure, uh, and you've mentioned to me previously that there's a lot of stories that you've heard from people um, from watching that checkerboard program. Um, you mentioned Mark Gillespie in their story. So Mark was Mark Gillespie was 17, 18. He lived in Joe Bielka Peterson, Queensland, in my, in a mining town, and I think his family might have moved around. Anyway, he so he was that young. He was having difficulty with coming to terms. There was no positive environment for him to come out. All he had ever seen were stereotypical homosexuals. Mm -hmm. And he describes, you know, this was the very first time he saw two men whom he described as normal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, interacting and just saying it's all basically saying it's all right it just happens to be part of me mm. and he went from there to become actually became a 78 er and he he became a lecturer at sydney university you know it's just one of those wonderful uh stories that have come out of out of checkerboard which to me are probably far more significant than the kiss, but I, I, I take your point. At, yeah. Yeah. And the connections that you got from that program, I think, you know, were extraordinary and it led you to lead, um, beginning the first homosexual telephone line. Uh, could you tell me more about that and what that's evolved into as well? Yes. Oh, thank you for that, Sam. Um, so as a result of Bond getting the SEC as, part, as a consequence of the checkerboard program, he got an, an enormous amount of media coverage, which was quite, but which was unprecedented. He had lots of radio interviews, television, newspaper, and somehow Camping's phone number or our phone number became Camp Inc's de facto phone number. Mm -hmm. And people eventually used to ring us here at home, where I am now. And, uh, you know, people just asking questions like, do you know, uh, uh, I've got a medical issue and I feel I can't go to my ordinary GP. Do you know, uh, as we would call today, a gay friendly, right gp lawyer all sorts of people mm -hmm. there were also calls from people who who were lonely who were just wanting to talk to somebody and perhaps tell us 
uh, how difficult their lives was. It might have been people like Mark, you know, living in the country or anywhere. Mm. So that became a really difficult thing for us to manage because, you know, we were, we'd bought a house in 1969, so 72, Bon lost his job. We only had one income at, at that time. And of course, Bond was looking for work, which in itself was quite difficult after the program. Uh, so the calls used, as you're probably aware, people who, who, who seek support or need some uh, personal, uh, uh, you know, not counseling, but just a friendly voice to yeah. listen. Yeah. Or, yeah. And, uh, so we used to get lots of calls at night. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine Bon having to look for work and then having this phone ring quite, on, you know, nearly 24-7. Yeah. So just before, I think it might have been the middle of, or sometime in 72, a Swedish guy had come to Australia. He joined camping at the time. He actually was at the house when the checkerboard was screened. And he, of, you know, we were good friends. Mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and. No one's home. <laughs> sorry. That's okay, Peter. I, I don't know why. Hmm. Oh, it's gone. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I thought that switched it off. Anyway, uh, so Krista Stahl was his name, and yep. he, when he was in Stockholm before he came to Australia, he had set up what he called a phone service. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he had set up a phone service called Phone a Friend. Mm -hmm. And he could see that we were having a really hard time. So he said, we should set up a phone service here, phone a friend. Mm -hmm. And we said, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Next, <laughs> next question was, where is it going to be housed? Well, Krista knew, knew the layout of our house. He said, well, you've got a front room. We can use that. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then he, he said he would organize a roster. And it, it started from there. And you know, the wonderful thing is 47 years on, it's still there, like uh, 2010, the Gay and Lesbian Counseling Service. So that's wonderful. Yeah. It's amazing it's evolved into such uh, an incredible organization. And I have to say, it's fitting that your uh, telephone went off as we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I think the universe was trying to uh, prove a point that uh, you have made quite the impact. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's perfect. Um, speaking of like the impact that you made with Camp Inc., tell me about the early education campaigns that you led as a part of it. We somehow, again, Camp's profile, you know, we became known and it became known that we were prepared to to go out into the community and and do education sessions with all sorts of different groups mm. and one i remember very fondly it probably was one of my first ones i i was at so that would have been I don't know, early 70s mid 70s mm. and it was with sydney university with one first year medical students and uh, so our role was to, I suppose, educate so-called straight people what it was like to be homosexual and a lesbian. Mm -hmm. And so we used to sit around in a circle and tell our life stories and then, you know, get some like Q&A. People would ask, well, like these first year medical students, well, how do you think I can once I'm a GP or in the medical field, how, how do you think I can better interact when I get patients that are gay or lesbian? So, yeah. So it was like in, 
education at quite a personal level. Mm. And your education campaign sort of focused a lot of the frontline services that the LGBTQA plus community has struggled with, like the police and the medical field, um, which I think is really significant in lessening the impact that they yeah. had on our community. And we did sessions with counsellors of, <laughs> of the family law court once it was established, I think, 75. Mm. Uh, school counsellors, we did sessions with uh, lots of different students from TAFE colleges. Uh, and I also remember going to what used to be called Milpera Adva College of Advanced Education. Mm -hmm. So we had regular sessions with new intakes of, of different professionals or, or students. Yeah, and I think education has the power to heal and to show other people our stories and our lived experiences and how you said, like, we're just normal like everyone else and we just want to do our jobs and be loved and yeah, of have a course. good life. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I keep saying, and I think that's what we basically said in the checkerboard program, mm -hmm. the only difference is that I am same-sex attracted. I just want, want to have sex with men. Now, that's not the only thing. Yeah. But look, I need nurturing. I need to be loved. I need to feel secure, all those kinds of things. So that the thing, you know, the homosexuality or the gayness, in a sense, is a very small part of us. Yeah, and that human connection is so important for so many of us. And it brings me to my next question, the significance of Camp Centre's coffee shop and how many lives that connected. 33A Glee Point Road, if you ever go over Glee Point Road, just have a look. Mm -hmm. All you'll see is a, I've, I've forgotten what the color of the door is, but anyway, so Camp felt it was important to establish a non, not-for-profit place where lesbians, gays, people could go and just, yeah, just share some friendship or make friendships. And uh, the, the, the significance, I suppose, is that it was the very first and probably the only, well, I'm sure it was the only, not-for-profit Mm -hmm. Now, to go to, not every person finds it uh, comfortable to go on their own to a gay bar or to a lesbian bar or, you know, because that, the whole uh, structure about that, those places is very different to the coffee shop we had. Yeah. So there would be a person, always a volunteer, maybe two, who would welcome every person that came you know, to, to the coffee shop, they'll be made feel, feel comfortable, introduced to some other people. So for many, it would have been the very first time that they actually met at a non-commercial at a, and not at a beat, you know, for men, uh, another homosexual or another le lesbian to just make friendships and feel, you know, this was like an oasis in a way. I can imagine it would have been so empowering for so many people just to be able to have a place they could have gone to make friends, to have connections, especially the introverts among us who just want to sit down with a coffee and yeah. have, have a chat. <laughs> yeah, and maybe play, you know, they used to play games, cards, I mean, and, you know, whatever they wanted to do, but it was just a the overall thing was a very frank, friendly, a very welcoming, a very understanding uh, place to go to. Mm, a place where we could all be safe together and... Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing, of course, those kind of places do is to, when you interact with your like, with likewise people, you probably learn things from each other. You form friendships, bonds. Maybe there were relationships that came out of it. And, you know, yeah. So there's lots and lots of very positive stuff at 33A Glee Point Road. 
I'll have to go find it so I can uh, pay tribute to the uh, the legacy <laughs> you've left behind. Uh, maybe drink a coffee out on the porch or something. <laughs> well, that's, so downstairs there was a like a shop front, mm -hmm. which when camp had the had the the building, uh, that was not part of camp. So ours was just a door, a very long passage, which might have been daunting for some people. And then the coffee shop, you know, was at the end. Upstairs, there were four or five rooms. The phone a friend was housed there. There was a library, a meeting room, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. That sounds so, that sounds great. Like, I wish it was still around now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, speaking of the the significant impact that camp had on the LGBTQIA plus community, can you tell me what happened when camp made a written submission to the 1975 Royal Commission on Human Relationships? Uh, yes, Michael Clossy was the was camp secretary at the time, and Michael was also a member of my three person's homosexual relationship mm -hmm. and uh, we set up a working group because we wanted to have input. I mean the, the terms of reference for that Royal Commission were very very broad and we felt we mm -hmm. could make a contribution about you know what our lives could be like if changes were made. So we, we wrote that long submission uh, and uh, uh, Mike being the secretary, he, he, he uh, promoted the submission via television program. Mm -hmm. And he at the time was a, a, a teacher at Amaris Brother Eastwood School. Mm -hmm. And of course, which was a Catholic school. And of course, as a result, he got the sack. So he was the second person in my close family Mm. who was sacked because of standing up against, you know, uh, homophobia. And uh, uh, then, <clears throat> so the, the, the Catholic hierarchy were worried that, uh, that we would bring up Bond sack, or no, sorry, Mark sacking at the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. And so what they did, the Catholic hierarchy in New South Wales, they brought in barristers and solicitors at a public meeting and they, you know, demanded that the Royal Commission not hear homosexual, homosexuality or homosexual relationships. Yeah. And uh, this went on, you know, there's lots of legal arguments and we lobbied the commission and said, yes, but our relationships are just as valid as, you know, straight relationships. Mm -hmm. And anyway, eventually the commission decided, yes, homosexual, homosexuality was included mm. in that terms of reference. So we were able to give evidence and yeah. Yeah, it's amazing that you uh, managed to get that through and to have your voice heard because it's important, especially at that period of time, such an important time to have our voices heard. And yeah. uh, another role and activism that you were a part of um, was the 1976 Tribunal on Homosexuals and Discrimination. Can you tell me more about your role with that as well? Uh, <clears throat> well, I came up with the idea to, to have... Uh, a, a tribunal on homosexuality. I'd been to, you know, quite a few conferences and I always felt conferences were a lot of like talk fests. Mm. Very little, some action came out of, but not enough. And of course, all of us realized at the time that there was a huge amount of discrimination going on in the workplace and, well, you, you, you're aware, all sorts mm -hmm. of uh, places. So we thought, why don't we try and organize a tribunal with some prominent people and get them, get people to submit their written discrimination cases and they'll get heard before the tribunal and the tribunal make uh, recommendations, which we eventually posted out to all sorts of different organizations. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first opportunity for individuals to actually present 
their discrimination, although it didn't have any legal standing, the mm -hmm. tribunal, right? It was a, in a way, a data collection, uh, an educational tool. Mm -hmm. And so we gathered 44 cases of all sorts of, you know, discrimination, people who were sacked from the military service, teachers, uh, yeah, and the list goes on. Mm. And so they made recommendations, we distributed, they were distributed. And fortunately, on the day, the, found, the uh, tribunal's findings mm. were compiled. <laughs> Malcolm Fraser devalued the dollar because we had hoped for a lot of, you know, like media coverage we had mm. set up. But no, uh, I think there was a journalist strike at the ABC. There was another reason, so we we got very little media coverage, but we did send out all the... Yeah, a bit and of bad then, timing. <laughs> sorry? A bit of bad timing there. Yeah, well, not <laughs> beyond our control, yes. <laughs> but, you know, we the data we gathered, so to speak, people's stories, we submitted to various places and eventually I feel it played a role in the development of some different kind of anti-discrimination laws. So, yeah. Significant. And Indeed. Like saying the first time that our community actually had the chance to voice some of the things that had happened to them in a public forum um, that was taken note of by the government and by, you know, powerful people in society. Yeah. So it would have meant a lot. Yeah. And again, you know, people who appeared themselves or via their written uh, statutory declarations it was all very legitimate you know what I mean they were not just stories written up people had to submit mm. a statutory declaration they could be nameless that was okay mm -hmm. but to actually you know get a hearing there were very few places in those days where our community got a hearing Mm, definitely. Well, thank you so much for that contribution, Peter. And uh, we're wrapping up the questions now. But uh, in conclusion, is there anything that you want to add? I'll, <clears throat> I have a, a concern and I've had it for quite some years. I feel there is a right wing, very strong right wing move in the world. And from my experience, Australia is usually slow in getting things from overseas either good or bad and i have a great concern about the fact that some of the rights we have so you know hardly fought for and all that that we, that they might erode we need to be really vigilant as a community and just watch out mm -hmm. I, I also have a concern about our the disparity of our liberation. Mm -hmm. You know, there are pockets in, in the Greater Sydney, in the Greater Sydney, that I feel still live a co the same kind of life that I lived 30 or 40 years ago. Mm. The only difference is for them, they can get married, there is there's anti-discrimination law, but there is this whole um community oh no sorry family structure which is very rigid mm -hmm. and uh, because of that you know our community members might are likely fearful about coming out and saying yes i'm getting married and i'm going to do that you know what i mean mm -hmm. so the 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 rights are in existence we didn't have mm -hmm. But for them to access them is can be difficult, I think. And it's a pity that there is a, you know, that there's pockets of disparity, I feel. Because I would love every lesbian, gay, transgender, you know, the whole acronym <laughs> to be to feel that they're, you know, properly treated and they can live their lives the way they want to live it. Definitely. You want liberation for all of our community. Yeah. You yeah. fought so hard for so long and it would be great if that was every for everyone and that our rights aren't jeopardized by the 
the rise of the right wing in Australia. Yes, yes. You yeah. know, and there's some really good examples. If you look at some European countries, which were quite advanced in terms of our rights, uh, that are slowly going back. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we definitely can't afford to do that. No, please don't. So stand up. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep on fighting. We'll keep, okay. on, we'll keep on fighting the good fight for you, Peter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we got you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today, Peter. It's been my absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done for our community. I'm deeply humbled and forever grateful that we had beautiful, kind and passionate activists like you that created a world that's better and safer for us all. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for everything you've done for us. Right. Th oh, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. But I, I do want to add, it wasn't just Bon and I, there were other people as well. But Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> I, I like to share it. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> All right. Well, to finish off today's session, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Matthew Pye from the School of Life and Environmental Sciences. He will finish up today's session with some concluding remarks. Matthew is co chair of the university's Pride Network, and his lived experience began in the amazing Sydney gay world in the 80s, just after Peter and co had begun all the hard work for equality and justice for LGBTQIA plus people. I'll hand it over now to Matthew, and thanks again, Peter. Oh, and thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, Peter, thank you so much. Like, what an amazing talk you gave us today. Um, I mean, uh, I'll try not to cry again, <laughs> but I'm in debt of your legacy, my God. Like, I came in just on the tail end of all the crap that you guys dealt with, and Sydney was starting its rise to be the, the global gay city in the world. And I was lucky to be just at the start of that. Not, not ignorant of the fact of what had gone before, but definitely blessed for what you had laid for us. I'm an evolutionary biologist, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to think of you as the common ancestor from which all of this came, you and Bon, and I, and I feel Bon here today as well, I must say that, yeah. I've yeah. before, right? Yeah. Um, and I'd just love to thank both of you so much for, from a, a totally personal perspective of making me who I am, and allowing me to be who I am, but also the freedoms and, and, and the acknowledgement just at the end of this is not over. And that's what gets so tiring as we get older, is that it's not over. We still have to fight. And, and I questioned myself being um, co-chair of the Pride Network early on, going, why, what? And since then, it's just become apparent that assimilation, or, or if uh, one better word, tolerance, acceptance, has its own dangers. It really does have its own dangers. And we've lost a lot, I think. I personally think we've lost a lot through that. We've gained a lot. And it's about marrying up that, that, that balance, you know? Yeah. Like, I long for the days that we were, like, separate and, and almost secretive and we had our, our music and our culture and our dance and everything that came with those early 80s years that was so special. Right. But I also acknowledge that it's so important to be recognised in society. And, and I would just love to thank you. I just... Zoom sucks. I would love to be here to give you a massive hug. I'm giving yeah. you a virtual hug and I hope to replicate that in the future. But Peter, thank you so much. And, and I, I really hope you understand the impacts you've had. Not only on my generation, I'm 52, but also on the generations um, below me that, that I hope to impart some of your knowledge on because that fight always needs to be omnipresent. Don't, yeah. don't forget that those people are still there. They're still thinking the same, even if they can't say the same. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Wow, so, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, but I'm crying so. now. <laughs> no, that was me before it. <laughs> no, but seriously, I could not have navigated my life if it wasn't for checkerboard and being able to see that. And that was 10 years later. And so, wow. my God, yeah. like, the impact that you've had on us as a generation, as my transgender friends, my intersex friends, and all the others that are reaping the benefits of your sacrifice, because you guys sacrificed a lot, you mm -hmm. know? Like, it was done in that, that empowerment of being 18, 20, and just like, yeah, 
F the world. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that comes at a cost and a personal cost. And I thank you for that. Like, it, it, it's not going unnoticed or, or unfelt. Thank you so much, Matt. And I'm absolutely delighted that I've been able to tell my story and I hope people got lots of stuff out of it. And yeah. Oh my God. And we'll go set, from here. Yeah, set that coffee table very soon, Peter. Okay. All, right. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. Thank you, okay. All right, thank you. Oh, Antonio, are you finishing off? Or? I just wanted to thank Peter again. <laughs> okay. Your, your, your remarks were the concluding remarks, so, so thank you both so much. Okay. Thanks again. And maybe a big hug. Oh. A virtual yeah. hug. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I'm sweeping oh. back in for your hugs, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Thanks again so for your time, and that's where we'll wrap it up today. Thank you okay. so much, everyone, for coming and watching and for sharing in Peter's story. And we're all going to have a cry now. And <laughs> maybe have a nap. Um, now. now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Peter. Thanks again, Matthew okay. and Antonia and right. everyone who ran the behind the scenes. Um, um, and have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, library, as well. And keep thank up you. to struggle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.